hello. It is July, which means another quarter has passed. Uh, and that means it's time to do a check-in on some quarterly faves. So last time I included more stats than I normally do, and a lot of you like that. Some of you were not as into the stats, which is totally fine. Um, so I'm gonna mix it up this time and we'll start with the books that were my favorites for the quarter, and then we'll transition into overall stats, how the quarter went reading-wise kind of at a macro level. So I've got nine books that I want to highlight because I gave six books four and a half stars and three books five stars. So makes it pretty easy to narrow down which ones were the fave for the quarter. Uh, so let's start with the ones that I do not have in physical form and then we'll talk about the ones that I do. Uh, on audio I listened to Empire of Pain by Patrick R. Keith and he's definitely I think on the road to becoming a favorite nonfiction author. I've got his new one Rogues that I need to listen to but Empire of Pain was one that my patrons picked for me to read as a five-star prediction and while it wasn't five stars it was four and a half, which I think, you know, for me is pretty close to a an accurate hit on predictions. Um, and this is not surprising because I feel like everybody and their mom loved Empire of Pain when it came out last year. And basically this is following the history of the Sackler family who were the owners of, or who I guess are the owners of Purdue Pharma, uh, which is the producer of Oxycontin. I think that Keefe is essentially making the argument in this book that because of some of the history of the family itself, they really were the drivers of what has become in, in the US um, really an opioid addiction crisis really is tied to um, kind of the promotion and the legislation that they did around Oxycontin, but they really learned it from their sort of original hit drug back in the day, which was Valium. Um, it was super interesting just to learn about the family in general and sort of like the inner family politics. All of that was very interesting. I will say that the parts of the book that for me were the most successful were when we were talking about sort of the business side of things itself. You know, I'm kind of, I don't know, maybe I'm in the minority of this, but I really enjoy sort of like histories of business that is interesting. So I'm thinking some of Michael Lewis's stuff, um, Bad Blood by John Carreyrou. Like I'm into getting into the nitty gritty of some of the shady business dealings. That is something that I enjoy. So for me, if that had been more a focus, probably this could have gotten five stars, but it was definitely a favorite of the year for sure. So four and a half feels right. Another four and a half star book that I do not have in physical form um, is Ruby Fever by Alona Andrews, which is coming out in August. And I can't wait for people to read this one because it is the finale in the second trilogy within the Hidden Legacy series. So we had the original trilogy, with Nevada. And now we have a second trilogy featuring Catalina. I just, this is such a yummy, delicious comfort read for me, these books. I would describe these as uh, urban fantasy romance. Um, I would say the Hidden Legacy series is probably heavier on the romance than Kate Daniels. Yeah, that's probably fair. But I would say in general, Alona Andrews is an author that I recommend to people who are interested in getting into romance, who are already fantasy or sci-fi readers, because I would say that their books tend to be very focused on the speculative and mystery plot elements of the book. Um, and there certainly are romances, like unquestionably, but I think that they could probably be a good bridging book one way or the other. Like if you're a speculative reader looking to get into romance or you're a romance reader interested in reading more speculative fiction, I think that they, yeah, kind of sit right there in the middle. But anyway, don't start with this book because it's the finale of a second trilogy, so it will not make a lot of sense, but there was a ton of macro plot wrap up that I had predicted and I found very satisfying. I'm also very excited to report that based on the epilogue, I'm pretty sure that we're getting another trilogy starring Arabella, which will be great. And uh, yeah, just overall, this was a super satisfying ending to that trilogy. Okay, so some other four and a half star. Okay, well, we'll talk about the other one that my patrons picked for me to read. And that was the fifth season by N.K. Jemisin. 
I just feel like I don't need to <laughs> be another person singing the praises of this book because it's so loved. It's so widely acclaimed from a critical perspective, from a reader perspective. Like this book is just great. I think because I accidentally figured out what the big kind of like <gasps> moment of this is, I think that dissipated some of the impact of that for me. And I wonder if this would have been a five star if that had not been the case. But the writing is fantastic. The world building is fantastic. The characters are fantastic. Like I don't have a complaint really about this and I am very excited to continue. I have the other two books and I am guessing, hoping, praying that this is going to be a five-star trilogy by the time I get to the end of it. Then let's talk about S, which I don't even know how to describe this. I actually, here's what I would say. This feels more like an experience than a book. It's literary fiction that is highly interactive. Basically think of this as maybe like a puzzle, but in book form. There's all kinds of extra materials inside of the pages. I truly wonder how the production of this worked, just like to get all the things, because sometimes there were things inside of things inside the pages. It was a lot. There's all of these different footnotes. There are literally websites and blogs dedicated to helping you figure out different clues or like understand different illusion. Like it's a whole thing. This is a book that I read, I guess, but I feel like because I don't understand all of it, I don't know. I, this is a book that I think would, that is inviting you to spend a lot of time thinking about it and processing it and rereading it and digging in further. So if that sounds like an experience you would enjoy, I really, like I said, I would think of this almost more like a puzzle. Like, I think this would be a really good gift to somebody who is both a reader and somebody who enjoys puzzles, because that's more what the experience, it's a it's an experience. You're gifting an experience more than a book. It's one of my favorite reading experiences I've had this year for sure. I wouldn't say, I don't know, I, I struggle to even talk, figure out how to talk about this book. I did a whole vlog like documenting my just like, I don't know what I just did, but it was good, I guess. It was very enjoyable as an experience to me. So this definitely is a favorite reading experience of the year. So that's why I gave it four and a half. Two never coming books. Uh, so first of all, Never Saw Me Coming by Vera Kirlon. This is just so enjoyable. I wouldn't argue that this is the highest quality book that I've read in the mystery thriller category this year. But I, you know, I actually feel very similarly about this book as I do about The Woman in the Library by Sulari Gentle. Thank you. Somebody corrected me on how to pronounce her last name. It's not that I would argue it's like the best quality, but it did what I want a mystery thriller to do, which is entertain me. I stayed up late reading this on a work night. So you know that I was into it. And basically the conceit is that there is this program at a university studying psychopathy. In the study are students of the university and then somebody starts serial murdering them. So it is about revenge. It's about serial killer. Like it has a lot of the tropes that I really enjoy and it's very voice driven. If you don't like the main, there's a few different points of view, but if you don't like the main point of view, which is Chloe, I don't think you'll like this book, but I loved her point of view and it was very voicey. I was into the writing. So yeah, I wouldn't argue that this is like the most surprising, the best, but it was highly entertaining to me and therefore that's why I kind of feel like it has to be a four and a half. So far it's one of my favorite mystery thrillers I've read this year. And then Never Coming Home by Kate Williams is a YA thriller that is a retelling of And Then There Were None. I think if you have read the original And Then There Were None, there's a lot of fun to be had in terms of seeing how she interpreted different parts of the original into this book. I will not say though it's one to one. So, you know, do with that what you will in terms of if you would enjoy reading it still. I just think that this is a super well, this is one of the best and then there were none retellings I've ever seen because I feel like it certainly honors the original. There's a lot of allusions to the original. And I think if you know what happens in the original, you can at least like get in the right ballpark of what the solution is. But it does something new with it. And it basically makes this a bunch of social media influencers. So I've been describing this as the fire festival meets and then there were none. This is really entertaining. I think for YA, it's very brutal. So just know that usually part of what I like about YA is that it tends to be a little on the cozier end of things. And I would say that this is not the case. I think that you could argue that this is really an adult novel that has young protagonists. So you know, it could be a bridging 
reading book in that respect too. But this just totally surprised me and I really enjoyed it. And I've gotten a ton of you who've told me that you had not heard of it, but you heard me talking about it and you picked it up and really enjoyed it. And that just makes me so happy because I feel like this didn't get a lot of marketing, but I think for what it is, it's a very good version of what it is. So definitely one of my favorites of the year. I was borderline five star on this, but I just decided like five star is an all time favorite. And yes, this is probably one of my all time favorite. And then there were none retellings, but that's a very specific sub niche <laughs> of book to be a favorite. So anyway, this is my last four and a half star. And then I had three five stars. Um, and yeah, I mean, on any given day, I probably could say any one of these was my favorite. I guess theoretically, Moonflower Murders, in terms of just sheer enjoyment, is my favorite. I do now feel the need to give you a warning because the more I've learned about the author, the more I'm like, ooh, some of the homophobia that I thought was like in the characters' mouths, I'm not as sure about now. So just know that. I want to give that as a big disclaimer. But in terms of just honest, in, like honestly, just did I enjoy this? I did. I think that this is just so fun. It's exactly my kind of mystery. It's a book within a book. It's a true whodunit. It feels like an episode of Midsummer Murders, but like the book version. And it feels very Christy in terms of like the kind of plot it is. I don't think the writing is Christie-esque, but the book within the book is clearly meant to be an homage to Christy. So that is certainly quite Christie-esque. But even just like the overall book of this feels very like the kind of mysteries that Christy wrote. So basically there is a woman who is missing. Our main character who we met in the first book uh, gets called upon to get involved for, you know, mystery plot reasons <laughs> and she's investigating like what it, why she's missing and it's at this posh country hotel and everyone's a suspect mysterious murderousness shenanigans ensue from there so if you like a true mystery whodunit this is very enjoyable just a content warning that again i read the homophobia in this as being in the perspective of the characters so just know that that is a thing in this book FYI there. I always, I know some people are like, I don't care about that. And other people are like, I would never, you just have to understand in the comments, I will see a wide variety of people, some of whom are saying, I don't understand why you're disclaiming this. Why are you disclaiming us? Some of which are saying, I can't believe you're still recommending this. Don't do that. So I'm trying to I'm trying to accommodate a range of opinions on what I know is a controversial topic, which is how much do we have to care about the author when it comes to books we enjoy. So one of the fun moments of being somebody who recommends book on the internet is you got to try to <laughs> meet everyone where they're at as best you can. My two other five stars. So one is How Jesus Became God by Bart Ehrman. Um, this book just met me in a moment as I'm kind of entering a second layer of deconstruction or sort of, I guess, maybe reconstruction, getting more interested in philosophy and theology again in a way that I haven't been for several years. This was just the book I needed. Um, this is basically talking about kind of like how, well, I mean, it says how Jesus became God, like, how, like, in the historical record, so far as we can tell, what did Jesus say about himself? What did people think about him originally? How did or didn't that change as theology developed? And I think part of what I found so compelling about this is, you know, I, I went, I took New Testament classes um, as a part of my graduate course of study. And it was from a very evangelical believing perspective, but none of the facts that he talks about in this are different than what was taught to me in that more believing confessional context. It's just how he's interpreting those facts. So I thought this was super interesting. I've been reading a couple of other books, which I guess you'll hear about eventually that are kind of on some of these same topics. Just a five star because this was a book I was ready to read in the moment that I read it. And therefore I feel like it has become a nonfiction fave. Uh, and then the last five star is The Golden Fool by Robin Hobb, which is the, oh goodness, the eighth well, I guess if you count the prequel novella, the ninth book that I've read in the realm of the Elderling overall series, it's the second book in the Tawny Man trilogy. And I was talking about this in my June wrap up, which is just that I feel like this is the book that made me really be all in with Fitz and the Fool, which is, <laughs> I guess, I don't know what that says, because we're now on the fifth book with the two of them as the main kind of characters. This book was a lot of 
really satisfying character growth, character payoff moments, you know, significant things in the overall macro plot. I thought that the plot of this one was really good. We had tie-ins from Live Ship, which were great. And yeah, just overall happily, happily giving this five stars. Okay, and then I thought that we could go into some more stats. So, so in total in the second quarter of the year, I read 63 books, 44 of which I owned, 19 of which I did not own. I read a total of 19,516 pages for an average book length of 310 pages. The average age of book I read was seven years old and the average amount of time it had been on my TBR was one year. I paid for 36.51% of the books that I read and the average amount that I paid for books was $3.89. Keep in mind, somebody was asking me how I keep that so low. I had a whole glut of free or 99 cent ebooks that I got back in the day. And I kind of, they're often just sort of like palette cleansy things. So I layer those in as I go and that really drives down my average cost. It'll be interesting to see over time, like as I kind of clear that backlog, if my average book cost goes up. Anyway, side note. Good lord, I have a ton of stats. The most frequent place I got books from was Amazon, followed by Kindle Unlimited, which I guess is also Amazon, and then Publishers. So I read 11 ARCs in Q2. In terms of demographic breakdowns, 38 of the 63 books I read were not like me in some way. So either the author or the main character had a meaningful difference in their identity to what I have. So well over 50%, which which is great because that's kind of my baseline. Still not, you know, doing great on reading more from men. I had 10 of those 63 books written by men and then one was written by neither. So there you go. Still mostly reading from women. I only had three audiobooks in Q2, way down from where it normally is. And only five of the books were either YA or middle grade. Most of the books I read were in a series. Most of the books I read were from repeat authors, so authors that were not new to me. In terms of breakdown of when books were published, the vast majority of them were published in the 2010s or later, so I'm reading a lot of more recent books in general. And then genre-wise, biggest genre was speculative romance, followed by mystery, followed by fantasy, and everything else which is sort of onesie twosie. And then ratings. My average rating was 3.15 which means my average rating was about a B plus. I had a nice little distribution going here with the most frequent rating given was four stars which I feel like has been typical of this year but in general is kind of unusual. So yeah I think those are some stats overall of how the quarter went. So let me know how your Q2 reading went April, May, June. June I feel like for so many people was kind of a bust which was also true for me uh, but hopefully you had a better June reading wise than I did. And yeah, I think that will do it for this video. So if you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social meds if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below and I think that that will do it. I hope you're having an absolutely lovely day today and I will just talk to you soon. Bye!